good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to contribute to what I think is a very timely and uh, well-focused uh, conference today. In fact, um, I've just come in from, uh, from, from Belfast uh, this, this, this lunchtime, uh, and I was looking on a plane at the agenda for the first time, um, and I, I suspect there's little I'm going to say that hasn't already been said this morning, uh, so quite why I got on the plane, I, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, in, in, in reality, if we're, if we're honest around this room from your backgrounds uh, and from the Commission's point of view, we've got many of the right structures in place. Um, and crucially, we know where the key fault lines lie within, within the whole uh, caring, care and health structure. Um, I say to you, not being contentious, but what we don't need are more regulators what we don't need are new czars, enforcement officers marching up and down hospital corridors. What we do need is a culture which encourages, supports um, professional pride, responsibility, a challenge, leadership, compassion, and yes, values uh, in actually valuing the intellect of, of, of our staff. And it was good to hear Lisa talk about many of those issues, uh, but I do hope that Health Education England does not move into some of the professional um, elements of actually educating and training our workforce. I don't think that's its, its role, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, I listened carefully to the reaction to the Robert Francis's report, um, as I did, sorry, uh, I keep forgetting that, over the reports on Winterbourne uh, View. I don't think anyone here denies there was culpable negligence on a vast scale, uh, which must be condemned and eradicated. But my plea to this audience and to every audience I speak to at the moment is not to allow the events at Midstaffs or indeed those at University uh, Hospital in Cardiff to dominate our thinking uh, and not to dominate it to the exclusion of all other factors as we seek to manage the most significant reorganisation of health and social care uh, since the establishment of the NHS uh, at a time of falling resources and rising cost. This is a major challenge and we need to have focus. Of course the 290 recommendations um, must be taken carefully from Robert Francis. And yes, actions will have to be taken, but they should only be taken where there is evidence to support the fact that they will improve uh, patient outcomes and patient care. Far too much of the immediate rhetoric, particularly political and media rhetoric, is based on anecdote and no matter how painful for individuals, basing policy on anecdote is not the best way of improving patient safety, outcomes or standards of care. The RCN as an organisation is at the centre of that storm. Uh, and the question uh, he poses about separating the RCN's role as a trade union from its professional duties will no doubt rage on ever since it was actually brought together it's raged on. Frankly, it's a distraction to waste time on it at this moment that the RCN, faced with growing discontent with the nursing profession the first time in my lifetime, has sought to actually confront that discontent, uh, and indeed with a, with a spirit which is open-facing, open I think has been really quite commendable to the RCN. Um, and I agreed to chair the Independent Commission to look at pre-registration education simply because of that open agenda. And to ask the question, does the process prepare tomorrow's nurses for their future role in a diverse, a largely community or domiciliary-based health and social care system? And Francis does not look at domiciliary or community-based health care systems. Um, we launched in April 2012 uh, uh, our work with a tight time scale, time scale to try and publish before Francis recognising that nursing would be only part of his inquiry and he would not be looking uh, at nursing in non-acute uh, settings. Um, with, hindsight, with hindsight, I would have liked more time to put nurse education in a much broader context, particularly a more detailed look at preceptorship and continued professional uh, development. Incidentally, both issues which Francis uh, made some excellent recommendations on. Uh, we made clear, we made clear um, in, our, in our report uh, that, uh, sorry, we made clear in the report that on gaining registered status, um, a nurse is not the finished article. 
They're just actually beginning their journey uh, and should continue to be a learner throughout their career. But for that to happen, we need a seismic change in our approach and commitment to CPD. In all, we received evidence from 80 organisations, 23 witnesses uh, came to give evidence. We visited every part of the United Kingdom and we reviewed all the recent literature. And I personally went through virtually every report that had been written since the Briggs report in 1972. Virtually every one of them said the same thing, by the way. Uh, and what Briggs had said in 1972, and he wrote me a letter to this effect, was virtually word for word what we had in our report, so we needn't have bothered. Today, uh, today um, I don't have time to go through all our 29 recommendations, never mind the 290 from Francis. Uh, but hopefully our report and its considerable reference literature will be a basis for debate and discussion uh, throughout the whole of the, of, of the sector. So let me highlight what I consider to be some of the key conclusions and uh, recommendations. Patients at the heart of education and training emerged as our core priority. And that was forcibly led by a panel member who was from Patient Voice, who was an MS sufferer um, and herself uh, and also an academic. We were surprised that some universities did not involve patient groups in the recruitment process and few involve patients directly in the development and delivery of the curriculum. Clearly, students meet patients and their families on placements, but embedding patient-centered processes at every stage of education, we felt was important in establishing that nursing is essentially an activity to support patients and their families. We looked carefully at whether aptitude tests to discover whether students had compassionate and caring qualities actually existed. Many claims are made about the accuracy of human behaviour profiling, of aptitude or psychometric testing, but we found little evidence that they were sufficiently robust to offer a de definitive profile to recruiters. Francis has made such a recommendation, and we should seek further evidence before relying too heavily uh, on that particular approach. Uh, there was criticism in, in Francis of the NMC, and quite rightly so, NMC has come in for an awful lot of criticism. The one thing I wouldn't criticise them for was their handling of the pre-registration education and the standards underpinning it. The review of that was robust, it took in the whole of the sector, uh, it gives plenty of scope for universities to develop curriculum, and quite frankly, going back to review all that and to start again is, an, is again a, a, a misjudgment and would be wasting very valuable time. Let me now turn to one of the core issues of graduateness. I was hugely frustrated and disappointed last week to hear politicians, media commentators and some patient groups questioning the value of an all-graduate profession. Let me say, whatever the cause of poor nursing at Midstaff's, Winterbourne View or Cardiff's uh, University Hospital, or indeed elsewhere, the evidence that it was a result of graduate nurses is simply not credible. Only 25% of today's nurses are graduates, so the poor care is, if anything, due to an education programme where graduate recruitment was the exception rather than the rule. And we found absolutely no evidence that there is somehow a conflict between having intelligent uh, recruits and compassionate recruits. And I know of no academic study anywhere, and I look carefully for it, that draws such a conclusion. The argument that we should be recruiting into nursing students with good intellect and compassion must be made at every single opportunity by everyone. Let nobody question that fundamental assumption. To be clever and kind is not a contradiction. Having said that we were actually aware that the public need to know, uh, having said that, we were very strongly aware that the public need to know what they can expect of a registered graduate nurse. They need to be aware of the huge technological changes in caring for patients with multiple mobilities. The increased specialisation of drug dispensing, interventions, public health responsibilities, and the fact that often in community settings, the nurse is leading a team of multi-professionals uh, people. 
And healthcare providers too must understand the huge array of skills a graduate nurse brings with them, and they should utilise those skills when planning the, the, the nursing uh, mix. Far too often too, witnesses to our inquiry, including students, fail to understand what graduateness actually meant in the context of nursing. Yet Francis articulated it quite brilliantly. We need nurses to be critical thinkers, to challenge poor practice, to observe and seek to improve, and to be leaders of clinical and non-clinical teams. In essence, that's what was missing at Midstaffs. But we will not make the most of our increasing pool of talent unless we support the nursing academic workforce and guarantee its future qualities. We recommended the establishment of a national uh, clinical academic career structure to ensure time and opportunity to teach in care delivery settings as well as in the lecture room, to support engagement in research focused on improving care and to ensure education is patient-centred. To this end, the universities must work with healthcare providers to establish joint university healthcare roles for clinical academics. It is not good enough to simply lecture in the university. They have to lecture where the placements are actually taking place. And perhaps before I leave this theme of graduateness, and I get very excited about it, uh, let me make a plea for improving the research base in HEIs and instilling a research ethic into undergraduate programmes. We need to persuade vice-chancellors that nursing faculties must be given resources to carry out research. It's crucial to build an evidence base for high-quality nursing. Far too much of the literature which we reviewed was anecdotal, it was observational. There were case studies and they lacked the rigour of other academic disciplines and that's not good enough. What is more, far too many students we met regarded research as an extra to get their degree rather than an integral part of their programme. It is not. Research begins with observation, challenging what's seen and providing solutions or improved pathways for care. It's not the sole province of academics or people in white coats. It's what all graduates in whatever discipline should be encouraged to do. In nursing, research is fundamental to improving care and patient outcomes, and it must be given greater priority. I'm sorry if I'm overrunning. Let me now turn to a key element. You want to hear the rest of this, don't you? The, the, let me now turn to a key element of our report, which deals with the student experience in non-higher education settings learning to nurse. Francis emphasised the need for nurses to learn how to care, and my commission would wholeheartedly agree. Quite frankly, this is an area that leaves a great deal to be desired. The push to expand student numbers, largely as a result of Project 2000, coupled with the increasing use of non-acute settings uh, due to shifts in healthcare delivery, which will continue, has led to the use of practice environments that are not conducive to good practice. Given that this is where students put theory into practice, where they learn from the collective experience of a wide range of professionals, and where their core competencies are signed off, the practice environment must be given greater emphasis than at present. Far too many students spoke of hostile environments, of feeling unwanted, of being afraid to challenge poor practice, and of having mentors with little time to support them because they were too busy doing their core jobs. We made a series of recommendations. Managers, mentors, practice education facilitators, academic staff must work together to help students relate theory to practice and close effective collaboration between universities and practice settings should be enhanced through joint appointments. Um, learning uh, employers and universities must work together uh, to identify positive practice environments in a wide range of settings. More placements must be made available in community settings, including medical general practice, but they must be high quality. It's a nonsense, ladies and gentlemen, that we actually have GPs who are at the heart of community nursing and they are not used as placements for our students because we can't afford them. That's a nonsense and we must... Act. Sorry, I get excited again. <laughs> the absence of funding to... You'll like this, Ewan. The absence of funding to HEIs to support nursing students' practical learning experiences must be addressed. At the moment, it is a freebie and it cannot go on like that. 
we made the bold suggestion that nurse education should be included within the SIFT for their, or their equivalent allocations. And I think that that has to be addressed. Finally, the appointment, training and support of mentors must be taken far more seriously. Unless mentoring is seen as a high order professional activity with adequate support from the host institution, we cannot hope to provide our future nurses with the skills and inspiration they need to offer quality care with compassion. Not everybody, ladies and gentlemen, is suited to be a mentor. Mentors must be selected for their knowledge, skills and motivation, adequately prepared, well supported and valued with a recognised status within the organisation. Employers must ensure mentors have dedicated time for mentorship and universities must play their part in training and updating mentors. Quite frankly, I do not believe that any one of our recommendations about positive practice environments would find disagreements with anybody who actually works in the sector. The challenge now from HEIs, from healthcare providers and the government is to make it happen. Those of you who are at the driving force, and if I might say, the deans who are so responsible for our students, pre-registration students are your responsibility. No student should be put in a placement that does not match the standards you would expect from your own staff in your own university. So let me conclude by saying it was a huge privilege uh, to actually chair the commission. The vast majority of people I met from community nurses to nursing deans, and we had a brilliant one, Margaret Smith from Dundee on our panel, from mentors to students were absolutely inspirational and had just one goal to improve patient outcomes. So often their ability to do so was thwarted not by the system itself, but by a health and social care bureaucracy that operates in an ever greater number of silos, each with its competing ambitions. The challenge post Francis and post Willis is not to create yet more silos, but to break down barriers and recognise that we are all in this together. Now that's a political <laughs> slogan that's worth doing. Thank you very much indeed.